Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Open Mind Circle Elite Executive Roundtable, Creating a Strategic Growth Plan, the Bancroft Case Study. I'm Stacy Fox with the Open Minds Market Intelligence Team, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Lindgren, Chief Clinical Officer, and Judy London, Chief Strategy Officer for Bancroft, a leading regional nonprofit provider of programs and services for individuals with autism, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and those of, in need of neurological rehabilitation based in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Karen Lindgren, PhD, has more than 25 years experience in neuropsychological assessment and treatment of brain injury and neurological impairment. A licensed psychologist, Dr. Lindgren oversees healthcare and nursing services, the Applied Behavioral Analysis Center of Excellence, and quality assurance across the Bancroft organization. She joined the team in 1997 as a senior neuropsychologist and recently served as the senior director of Bancroft's Neuro Rehab, supervising rehabilitation therapies in central and southern New Jersey, managing clinical staff and maintaining several university partnerships. Judy London joined Bancroft in 2015 as chief marketing officer before being appointed to chief strategy officer in 2019. She oversees strategic planning, business development, government relations, marketing, communications, and admissions. She brings over 25 years of experience in developing strategic results-driven campaigns to introduce new products and services to grow businesses throughout the region. Today's session is moderated by Raymond Wolf, an Open Mind Senior Associate with over 40 years of experience in the health and human services sector. His expertise includes financial analysis and management, mergers and acquisitions, performance improvement and strategic planning. Ray has spent 22 years with Pittsburgh Mercy Health Systems in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania prior to joining the Open Minds team. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders. Your audio is muted during today's brief. However, we encourage you to submit any questions through the GoTo system. We will present them to our speakers at the end. The slides and recordings from today's briefing will be available on the Open Minds website tomorrow. Ray, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacy. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I have never really been accused of being an optimist or looking at things for in a positive light. Um, in fact, I'm often paranoid in, uh, in, in terms of leadership issues and worried about structures. I'm always kind of overly focused on the negative, but I'm not feeling that way right now. I think we're getting ready for a post-pandemic growth period. And, and the reasons I feel that are just basic economic logic. And, and that is that there are three key factors to watching growth. Um, first, increased consumer demand. Now we all know what the pandemic has done on the behavioral health side. We know the increases in depression and anxiety we know the rapid growth in substance use disorders and, and the impacts they've had. On the intellectual disability side of our business, it's been similar. We're looking at um, brain trauma as, as an unfortunately growing situation that has to be dealt with. And we're looking at autism growing at an unbelievable rate. I, I remember seeing numbers that, that pointed to one in every 110 children uh, we're being born with autism and one in 70 uh, boys in that in that grouping. So we expect to see coming out of this increased consumer demand and not just because new consumers are coming in. What I think is happening in the pandemic is not that persons are experiencing more depression or more uh, substance dependence than they might have. But because others are seeing that stigma and the pressures that would keep people from seeking service may be lessening. All of that combined, I think, puts us in a situation where we can expect growth. The other two elements in this are one, if you have increased consumer demand, do you have a more efficient model for actually delivering that service? Can you do so in a way that allows you to increase production? And finally, do you have the capital to invest in those models? 
And while you may think those two are negative, I'm feeling relatively confident about both of them as well. Let me show you the next slide. This is a slide that, that Monica likes to use in indicating uh, these characteristics, which she believes will have a lasting impact on health and human services after the pandemic. And as you go down through those, you can see what I mean. Customer preference is changing for integrated care between social, behavioral, and medical. That's a model issue, a, a new model of care, a new model of production. Adoption of digital health in the Medicare and Medicaid population, also a new model of care. Health plans coming into the system and backward integrations of those plans, the new pay providers. That's bringing new capital into the market and new investments. Um, acceptance and preference for virtual primary care is both uh, an issue about customer demand and an issue about new models of care. What we're seeing is what we're calling outside investments in new companies in the market. By outsized, what we mean is that if you would look at the normal profit margins, you would anticipate persons being willing to invest a certain amount. But what is being invested is larger than that because people are taking bets on the fact that there will be rapid growth and rapid increase in size. So these outside invest, uh, outsized investments, I think, are indicators of more capital coming into the market and a belief out there that, that what we do is going to become more of an essential service. The creation of new digital health companies uh, and the entrance into our industry of mega health companies and health and human services is still about new models of care and new access to capital. Unfortunately, a lot of this capital that we're seeing coming in isn't directed at the traditional nonprofits. Let's flip a slide. It's coming in through other organizations. And on the other end of this, we're going to be needing to compete with a whole new group. We all know and the, the come partners, the competitor partners that we have in our local regions. But now we're going to be looking at national level specialty providers who will be moving into our areas. We're going to be looking at venture capital firms. Uh, many of our providers are already getting substantial numbers of blind inquiry letters about um, desires to become part of a bigger system or to be purchased. We're going to see an increased interest in hosp from hospital systems in what we do. I noted an AHA report just this last month that talked about the integration of behavioral health and substance abuse disorders into hospital systems and how that community presence would work. Insurance creating pay providers, these are incredibly powerful entities. National telepsychiatry, um, and folks like CVS, Walmart, and Amazon. Being able to compete with them is something I think we can do. If we weren't suffering from what I call bicycler syndrome, um, being a have a guy who used to like to ride bikes, I, I kind of realized that if we were on the level and we were driving along, I had plenty of time to look at the surroundings, to talk to people who were close to me, to uh, interact and exchange ideas to stop if I wanted and investigate something more closely. I had the ability to be creative and innovative and to enjoy and pursue tasks at a leisurely pace. But then it's West Virginia, so there would always be a hill. And on that hill, I'd have to work harder and harder just to keep the bicycle moving. And that's what I think we're doing today, working harder and harder just to keep the bicycle moving. What happens is your focus shifts to all you're looking at is the top of your knees and you're forcing them down one right after the other. And you don't see what's happening on this side. You don't even see what's happening in front of you. Your focus is entirely on the most essential, most fundamental pieces, keeping a program operational hiring staff, staying above water financially, 
those become so critical that we lose the focus on what's important and the reason we're driving the bike in the first place. The appreciation of the environment and being able to contribute in innovative and creative ways as we move through. So I would suggest this puts us in a place where everything is really looking our direction once we get past this period of fundamental problems. But we need now, not in the future, to develop those growth strategies and ideas that will help us move ahead, develop in our areas, serve people better, um, to, do, to have that kind of approach that you have when you're not just focused on the minute to minute, day to day, push down that pedal, push down that pedal kind of lifestyle. So it has been fascinating to me to see what Bancroft has done. Uh, Judy and Karen I've known for some time and they have made a remarkable change in their company. So I want to kind of share a conversation with them today and begin to chat about what they've done and how they're going to develop what they have even farther. Judy, you want to take it over? Sure, Ray. Uh, thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to point out that Karen and I are sitting very close together. <laughs> we had a little bit of a uh, of a technology issue um, in setting up, and we like each other very much and work very closely. But um, this isn't normally how we uh, how we work. <laughs> so I wanted to point that out. Um, Stacy, thanks so much for the introduction um, about uh, of both Karen and I. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, I think really what we wanted to, 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 to kind of give you some thoughts about is that um, I, I'm the, the first chief marketing officer this organization has had, and, and then subsequently the first chief strategy officer. Um, uh, you know, our CEO is, is really committed to um, understanding, you know, the, the, the right talent at the right time is essential to achieving your goals. Karen is the first chief clinical officer that we've had here at Bancroft as well. And so these firsts are not by accident, they're very purposeful. Um, and they're really positions that um, are really are, are, are positioning and, and supporting uh, Bancroft's uh, intent uh, and, and the plan that we've developed uh, to grow. I just wanna point out that, um, you know, we, uh, growth is really linked to so many things. Of course, what's happening in the industry, trends, payers, uh, you know, everything that we talk about um, in these sessions and, and at Open Minds conferences. It's also uh, part and parcel to consumerism and the need to diversify our payers and not only uh, you know, delivering uh, our services in a virtual or hybrid manner, but also reaching people digitally, providing access to us, right? When people need us, they need to find us. And so all of those uh, have a line to, um, uh, to, 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 to position this organization uh, to, to grow. I just wanna say that I know that many organizations that um, are, are participate in open minds are, are much smaller than, than Bancroft and, and, and we get that. And so are very operationally focused, right? It's a necessity. You, you need to manage your business day uh, day by day. And so these positions may seem like a luxury, like, oh, you know, we were not big enough for that. And so while you may not have the luxury of having a devoted person, having someone devoted to growth is, is critical um, when you're when you're thinking about growth um, as a strategic um, a strategic imperative. Do you want to add anything? Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, a chief clinical officer is an unusual partner for someone who, a chief strategy officer. But what I brought to this position were very long tentacles, both internally and externally, that were able to activate and leverage clinical talent networks, which really made it the perfect partner for my friend Judy. And why we can sit so close together. Um, Ray, we, we agree with your assessment uh, of the industry and where it is today. And, and uh, you know, from somebody from a marketing background, I've worked with all kinds of, uh, of businesses and organizations and, uh, and, and uh, you know, understanding that the, not only the trends, but, but the, you know, the market, what's happening in the market, macro and micro. Um, you know, one of the things that we recognize, thank you, is that, um, you know, you have to be ready for growth. Um, and maintaining, um, you know, uh, maintaining a focus on growth while you're operating is, is really critical. What we hope to really offer you today is how we positioned Bancroft uh, for growth, even in the hyper-challenging times we've been through over the past two years. Um, how to engage organizational leadership, critical in all of this. Um, identifying new and external resources, leveraging the talent within the organization, the talent you have. We think that's our secret sauce. 
uh, and of course, um, you know, extending your reach so people people know uh, know about you. It's so easy to get caught up in the frenzy of a crisis, right? Think about what we've been through over the last two years. In fact, um, Stacy and Ray had reached out to us back in in January, and even we got caught up, caught up in a bit of a crisis. We had as as Omicron was kind of tamping down. Uh, we're here in New Jersey, and New Jersey's governor issued an executive order requiring all of our staff, everybody. Um, to be uh, fully vaccinated and boosted within a very short period of time. Those of you uh, in, who, who, are, who are from the operations side know that workforce is probably our number one challenge. And so, as you can imagine, having to make sure that everybody was vaccinated at a time when that was not necessarily required, desired but not required, um, you know, was, was a bit of a challenge. But um, it's another crisis. Um, and so, you can get caught up in it or you can say, we have the talent, we have the skills to be able to work through it, uh, and that we want to keep our eye on, on the growth ball. So if growth is a strategic priority, um, addressing it as an, as, uh, as an imperative, which is as important as the health and operational challenges of the organization, that, that's, that's the way you have to go. Uh, and, and growing, and growing on that imperative, I, I, think it's, I think it's critical for smaller organizations to understand that that's that that's where it starts, that there has to be a voice through all of this that continues to refocus people on the future. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a part-time employee, maybe it's an extra job for an executive team member, maybe it's a board member with specific skills who wants to step up and take a little bit of a leadership role talking through with people. But creating that role that, that the two of you assumed, I think, whether it's a full-time, a part-time, a volunteer or what, it becomes essential to just kicking off the process. As I've looked at your case study, that to me was kind of step one. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, some, somebody or someones have to be the voice of growth uh, in the organization. Um, but, you know, it also starts with, are you ready, right? Are you ready for growth? Um, four years ago, we engaged Open Minds. Uh, George Bronstein was our uh, our, our assigned professional, uh, and it, we in, uh, invited George to help us develop a strategic plan, which we wanted to be based in growth. We wanted to have a, a pathway, right, to, to, to grow. Um, we worked over several months, and George had the very hard job of telling us that we were not ready for growth. He spoke with many people in the organization. He looked at, um, you know, at our engagement surveys. He looked at our capabilities. Um, he looked at the way we, we talked about growth. So this growth IQ area is, is so critical because he asked us these questions. And as we worked through them, we realized that we were not ready for growth. It was a really tough place to land, um, but we knew that um, you know, we had to work through it. If we wanted to grow, we had to, we had to, address, um, uh, we, we, we had to address our capabilities. You, what, the last thing you want to do is develop a plan that you can't deliver on because then you lose the trust of the organization and you lose the trust of the board. And so any plan that you develop, whether it be a growth plan or otherwise, must be based in reality, must be steeped in data, and must and you must be able to provide clarity around why you're doing it, what you're doing, and how you're doing it. These are the areas that we, um, uh, we, we focused on after George pointed out our, our shortcomings. Um, and so over the, the our, we had a three-year strategic plan and we worked through these four and one other area. So, uh, you know, I think these are self-explanatory, right? People and talent. Um, we needed to not only recruit more, but we needed to recruit better. We needed to retain more uh, so that we had some consistency in our operations. And so we, um, it, just to give you an example, we invested in the development of an employer brand uh, and we treated recruitment as a service line. So the marketing team here markets, markets Bancroft as an employer. And then of course we needed to identify and hire talent needed for growth. When it comes to data and capture, the question is how do you set up your data so that you can let it run itself while keeping your eye on it and enable you to focus, not get stuck in your bicycle mode, but to let you focus on other things as well. So the, the, we spent three years identifying our key KPIs, building dashboards, collecting them, testing them for quality. But more importantly, we spent time investing in the structure to analyze that data so that there is a system that that data flows through 
and someone can always keep their eye on the ball. As, as a benefit of that, that when we set that up and COVID hit, we were really well positioned to have the COVID run through this, these natural data sets and we were able to monitor it, react to it, respond to it while continuing to focus on growth. Great. Um, business operations was another area. You know, we all have finance departments. We all have processes for, you know, for, for billing and, and for denials and, and for how we're going to, uh, to, to, to manage the business we have. In here, in, in this area, we, we not only changed the way uh, we budgeted, but we also really focused on process and discipline around business development. And, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but we, we wanted to make sure that we had a system in place that when we were making decisions about growth, that we had rigor around uh, around the process and that we were able to, um, you know, if, if somebody were challenging us, we had the answers because we it was based in, in, in data. And then finally, um, our clinical excellence. And, you know, Judy referenced earlier that this was our secret sauce. I think we really believe this really is what was a game changer for us. First, we had to define clinical excellence. What was it? What are the high quality outcomes we bring to the table? What can we deliver consistently? Where do we want to go? But then there's another data point that organizations might not pay attention to, and that is cataloging their clinical talent. Not just the licenses, types, or the professional identities, but what are the skills and networks that your clinicians bring to the table? Are they linked to universities? Do they teach in classes? Are they members of their professional organizations and what roles do they have there? What are their passions? Your clinicians are the ones who are closest to the problems and have their finger on the pulse of the answers for how you need to solve those clinical problems. And then, Karen, yeah. um, two quick questions. One is, how did you move from point A to point B? I, you know, it, it, this structure makes a great deal of sense and a great PowerPoint slide, but how do you convince staff who are have an enormous inertia about what they do and the processes that they're doing to actually move forward. So I can speak to the clinical staff in particular. You know, what really um, is, is tremendously obvious to me is that this topic in and of itself is extremely exciting to clinicians. Clinicians want to do best practice. They want to be on the cutting edge. The challenge is, that clinicians have lots of great ideas that go nowhere. And why is that? Because maybe their idea is not aligned with the organizational priority. Maybe their idea is not aligned with the market intelligence. So to bring in a structure that helps educate them about how you let the cream of these ideas rise to the top and then support it with the structures you need really just kind of like lit a fire underneath them. You know, what I, what I say is that like the day-to-day -day is what they do, but the growth is really what they want to do. They want to dream big. They want to do big things. And all of the, the clinicians are excited to be a part of this opportunity. I think the space study that you had was actually started by a clinician trying to describe to you a better way to, to do the, the, the process. That's exactly right. So we have, I know I'll, I will get into it a bit, but we had one clinician who is extremely well connected and saw a service that's provided only in five or six other places in the country and said, we have the talent in house to do this. We should do this. And I was able to work with Judy to really find the right data sources to see if this was a feasible thing and move it forward. So, so capitalizing on that, what your clinicians know and listening to them is, is really key. You know, there's not a day that walks by that, that goes by that and walks through a program where a clinician doesn't say to me, you know what we should do? We should do this. So the ideas are there. It's helping them put some discipline around those ideas and connecting them to our business folks. Yeah. Well, the last question, this database of passions and talents, that's the first time I've ever heard anything like that. You really have like a spreadsheet of everybody with the listing of, of what they do and what their licenses are. What does this look like? So, you know, we have, uh, we're actually redoing it. Um, we do a Google survey where we include all of the professional um, connections that people have, the professional associations they belong to, their CEUs. We've tried it in different ways. We've had, you know, within disciplines, people check off their specialty areas, what they're bringing to the table, but we're, we're moving it up to a larger 
um, collection of data and I'm working with my HR department to determine how best to incorporate that into one centralized employee record so that we have that uh, information readily available to us. Wow. You know, Ray, we, we realize that beyond the clinicians, um, you know, everyone in the organization really needs to be uh, behind growth. You know, we need we need growth believers, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, building a herd of people who understand it, who embrace it. I would say that, you know, when we first started down this path, you know, a lot of people have the word growth with a line through it, yeah. uh, you know, saying, we, oh, no, 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 you, you don't even, you don't understand, you don't know what you're asking us. And so we realized that um, we needed to talk about it. We needed to explain why we wanted to and why we needed to grow, what the benefits were to the organization and what the benefits were going to be to you as a member of the team. Um, we needed to talk about what we're going to do to grow. You know, what are we focusing on? Um, the process we went through to think about what our priorities are, what our strengths are, where we see it within the market, how our strengths align with the market and what our payers are looking for. Um, we had to, um, you know, also talk like how we will grow. You know, we, will, will, we, will we add resources? Will we add talent? Will we bring in um, uh, consultants? Um, growth, uh, growth as an esoteric concept was not selling. We really needed to create clarity uh, around it and we need to engage people so that when we said the word, we didn't get that, you know, that, that look on the face, right, of something that smelled really bad. We wanted to make sure yeah. that, that people were on board. And so, um, and, and also, uh, in a way, prove that we can operate on multiple planes. We can be excellent operators while we're also positioning ourselves and, and then engaging um, in growth. So, um, you know, we, we listened bi-directionally, we met people where they were, we helped them see the value in growth, um, and, and uh, you know, it took a lot of time. I wouldn't say that it happened in a short order, but we realized that you can't impose it, right? You have to engage. Um, the other thing that I, I think is important here when you're developing a, a, a growth-based strategic plan is, right, you need to know what's going on. I mentioned earlier the, the market, right, macro and, and, and micro. What's happening in my backyard? What's happening in our industry? What's happening with payers? What's happening all the way around? So gathering intelligence and insights from everywhere. We get 15,000 calls a year to our contact center. 15,000, a third of those is uh, are really um, dedicated to our uh, Bancroft Noir Rehab, our, our uh, brain injury rehab business, and the rest are, are really related to autism and IDD. Um, that's a lot of intelligence. That's, you know, People are telling you what they need. Payers are telling you what they need. Um, and, and we're learning um, to look for those opportunities, not just say, sorry, we don't do that, but gather it and track it so that we can see what the opportunities are to us. The next thing is to establish, establish a dedicated funnel. You know, conversations and calls for opportunities were coming in all throughout the organization. And sometimes they, you know, they would say, oh, I, I spoke to so-and-so. They, you know, oh, they had an idea, but it wouldn't go anywhere. So we established a dedicated funnel. Everybody knows where to send. Uh, a call or an opportunity or something that they may see some some future in, uh, and we take the time, right? We when the call comes in, um, it doesn't get lost. We gather the intelligence from the call. What are people looking for? What are businesses looking for? Um, we make new friends, so we learn from the people that are calling us as well. We share our story so that they're not only does that caller know us, but they're able to share it with others, uh, and then we're able to make a, an informed decision uh, about what we're going to do next. Next thing one is of the, awesome. one yeah. of the things I like about this process so far that we've talked about that I want you to just kind of underline is, is talking to direct line staff, taking for taking seriously the phone calls. It's very grassroots or centered. It's very focused on um, the the persons most at the front line of these process. Mm -hmm. And I'm I, I had never seen anyone do it uh, that much work in organizing the external questions and help calls that you got into some kind of structure. Yeah, there's there's a, a, a great team of people who are on the front end who are uh, you know who are taking those calls and listening to people. And if you just let it go and you don't track it, then you lose the ability to understand what's happening in the market. So that was really uh, really important in all of this. And truthfully. As Karen shared, great ideas come from throughout the organization, from experiences that people have in their lives. Uh, and so, um, you know, we're, we're able to do that. I'll tell you just a quick story. We're, um, 
you know, we, we were in contact with a, a transit system to do some consulting around autism. And it turns out that the transit system um, would like to hire people with intellectual disabilities uh, and autism for uh, for some so a store for some of their uh, their activity. And so we could have said, well, that's not what we're calling for. That's not what this is about. Okay, sorry. And instead, that opportunity came into the organization and is moving forward because somebody was able to put two and two together. And while it wasn't perhaps the initial uh, initial reason for the call, we now have an opportunity that we didn't we didn't have uh, in the beginning to not only build on our excellence, but provide an opportunity to those we serve. You know, Judy, I just want to make a comment. You know, that process for due diligence, um, the other thing it did really was build a lot of trust among our employees that we took their ideas seriously and that there was a why into why we chose certain ideas or didn't choose certain ideas. So there wasn't, people didn't feel disengaged or unheard. They understood what the process was. Yeah. That was really critical. Yeah, and you know, uh, beyond that, I mean, we we do have a process for due diligence of an opportunity. It's a fast moving one. You know, uh, um, my favorite saying is time kills all deals. So, uh, you know, we know that we need to move quickly to determine whether whether we're gonna go go forward or not go forward. And then beyond that, you know, how we're gonna how we're gonna bring um, that 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 partnership, that acquisition, um, you know, to uh, to fruition. So it's a the process involves all the key people, and it's you know if and then once we get beyond if, then it's how, and it works. It works beautifully. And then finally, and to me, this is really one of the most critical pieces, is that you have to invest in growth, right? You can't just say say we're going to grow and not have not have dollars associated with it, not not recognize the need to engage perhaps a consultant, um, not hire folks. Uh, and Karen will talk about that in a minute, but not hire folks who you need. So committing to fund and resource growth is critical, and that message is really important for the team, right? It helps them understand that we know that we're not gonna grow off the people who are already working at 110%. I think that's important too, to, to mention to folks that, one, it's, 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 it's resourcing, so it's both talent and money, but right. on the money side, even organizations who don't have a great cash reserve have access to federal funds right now that are pretty substantial have access to foundations, um, have access to banks that are very concerned about investing in the community and, and making sure that they can be involved in job growth. So there, there are places out there that you can reach out to for, for growth ideas if you have a compelling idea. Yeah, there's there's lots of ways to go about it. I just wanna, I just wanna focus on these three areas. I'm gonna turn it over to, to, to Karen, but you know, understanding your growth levers. Organic growth is perfectly acceptable way to grow. In fact, most of us have grown mm -hmm. organically from our inception. Uh, we certainly have. Um, growth, you know, focused on programs and services that deliver the best margin, of course. Uh, more of what you already do, what you know, what you do well, what your reputation is based on. So, uh, organic growth is is a is a you know a piece of our uh, of our growth plan. Um, merges acquisitions and affiliations equally, right? Um, we have spent a lot of time identifying our sweet spot, both in terms of um, you know the types of services uh, that we would like to or that we look for in a, in a potential um, acquisition or, or affiliation um, you know defining our own attributes what we bring right how we can um, you know bring our capabilities to the table um, and then network and engage um, and you know like we're doing today uh, I, one thing that I've learned is that the, you know the more people you talk to the more people you talk to they everybody wants to introduce you to the next one um, and uh, the last 18 months have been really remarkable in terms of uh, being able to share our story and talk to folks about opportunities um, uh, in so many ways. And then lastly, new programs and services, right? So what does the market need? Karen touched on that earlier. What do payers want? Do you build it from the ground up? Do you find a partner? Do you acquire it? Uh, and that, those are some of the conversations um, you know, that, that we've been having around new programs and services. And um, part of our role here today is to share how we brought a new program, a new service to market. Yep. So here we are, we're a large organization. We have almost 250 clinicians, licensed individuals, reflecting a variety of disciplines who all have great ideas. So what Judy just talked about regarding the business design process, we had to put the same rigor and processes in place for a clinical design process. We had to create a structure to be able to funnel through all of the information and all of the ideas that were coming to us and put a process into for due diligence. We have a couple of structures internally. We have uh, Applied Behavior Analysis Center of Excellence 
that is responsible for making sure that what we do as a in behavioral analysis is the cream of the crop and is associated with best practice. We have an internal clinical excellence committee, which represents clinical leaders from across the organization and new ideas that are brought to that committee. It is their job to vet through, to say, what is the evidence base? Is this the ideal best practice? Is this something we as an organization could clinically get behind? Involving the clinicians in that way helps them understand the why. It helps them understand how we're going to align with the business practices. And it really gets them on board and talking to all the clinicians. But equally important is for us to understand what we cannot do or what we don't have the talent to do. So we know behavioral health, those, it's an area that's really, really growing. That might not be an area we have the internal talent for, but that might be an area we want to partner with or we want to bring in organization. How would we make those tentacles? The only other thing I'd like to add is that once we have vetted through the clinical ideas, we have to somehow marry that with the market intelligence and the organizational strategy and the organizational mission. Because if the, the secret is when all three of those things are aligned. You have the brand new idea, organizational talent, organizational mi mission, and market. So let me tell you about two new service lines we started. And these were services that came from two of our clinicians. So we, had, um, we have one clinician, as I mentioned, who is very, very well connected. She um, is an, a doctoral level BCBA. And she knew of a severe outpatient day treatment program. There's only about five or six of them in the country. And she saw in the literature the tremendous impact they were having on children with autism who have really severe challenging behaviors. We have a residential program that treats children with severe and challenging behaviors. So I introduced that clinician to the um, marketing team first and to Judy's strategy team. And we looked at where our opportunities were. We had an opportunity to help individuals in our pipeline who are waiting for services, which extends our mission to serve more individuals using the best possible service possible. And then we had to align that, what she was doing and teach her to speak the language of the business team and to teach the business team to speak the clinical language. That process was what, a year? A little more, or, yeah. a little more in the, the making. Her idea and her model required our business operations department to think differently about how we function and what systems are necessary, what was going to be necessary to succeed. This service is built on single case agreements, which is not something we typically do. So we had to help our business department understand the value of this service and why that was an important task to take on for really a relatively small service to start with. And we had to teach our clinician to speak the language of business. So she was able to prioritize from a clinical point of view, how would you launch this business in a measured way? Because we couldn't jump all into the deep end of the pool immediately. We needed to build it slowly. And how would she develop the clinical steps that were necessary to make it an excellent practice. So then, of course, then there was lots and lots of connections with our marketing and admissions team because they're representing this to the outside world and they need to understand both the business and the clinical model so they can represent it accurately to all of our folks. It was this team that actually began making the contacts with the insurers? Yes, Ray. Uh, we we have uh, over the past, you know, uh, seven eight years or so, we have really built um, a remarkable database. Um, you know, if, if we've spoken to you, you and our you're in our database. Uh, but it's it, it's it's important because there's a there's a trust factor, right, with your payers. There's a trust factor with those who refer to you. Um, and so we um, launched the program in in November by announcing that we were going to be doing it. And we had we we had six different categories of um, of contacts um, that we that we informed uh, and and really talked about it you know, directly to them uh, in addressing their needs. Um, what I found most interesting is um, one of them was a um, I'll call it a secondary target, and has really become uh, a primary source of referrals for the for the service. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's really interesting and you never know. And, and uh, other folks who are providing the service are not having the same experience. So it was uh, you know, interesting to us, perhaps it's the way we, uh, we, we spoke to them, but um, we started getting calls from, from payers, families for sure, um, physicians, lots of folks in schools. Um, it is, uh, you know, when, when you've got 40, 50 kids sitting in a pipeline waiting for residential treatment, there's certainly an opportunity there to determine if any of those kids could get access to services sooner uh, and perhaps even prevent them from um, needing to, uh, to have a residential treatment, residential placement at all. And you know, that intelligence that we had, so our clinician leveraged her professional networks. By the way, by doing that, she was able to connect the business folks at those organizations to our business folks to help educate people about how these single case agreements work. But now she's going back to them and saying, you know, we're getting some good referrals from school districts, a source they hadn't thought about. So we're able to share our intelligence with them and really become part of that community and further the business along. You know, the other piece I just want to add is that, you know, we mentioned about bringing talent on early. One of the things we did and were really successful in, we brought on clinical talent early because we need to be ready for this to go. But then we leveraged that talent to do other things for us. The consulting um, work that Judy was mentioned to got off the ground because we had extra clinicians on board who could develop all of our materials. We used those clinicians as sort of a clinical SWAT team to go and manage some of our most challenging cases and support our organization. So you have, it's it, thinking creatively about how to leverage that clinical talent is really critical. The, the other service that we were able to get off the ground, and this happened in a little bit different way, Judy's team identified um, a group of individuals who were looking for someone to provide pediatric autism assessments. Because of our clinical connections and our clinical catalog, we knew that we had a clinician in-house who, in a previous position, did exactly that. When we tapped into her, she was an amazing resource. She had the business model laid out. She had the CPT codes. She had the test equipment. She had the business model ready to go. So we were able to partner with this group pretty seamlessly by leveraging her skills with what was needed in the market. These two services, the severe behavior date treatments and the diagnostic services, are now the initial services that are going to be launched under this service line called autism services. We plan to build these services out with the, with the services that you see on the screen, identifying in each of them who are the in-house clinicians and who are the external experts that we need to connect with in order to make them successful. So the recruiting issue strikes me as a problem. Um, and I'm sure there are folks listening to this that are thinking, okay, all I, if I were to go into a day treatment and tell one of my staff there that I really wanted them to do something else or something new, um, I would probably be bludgeoned with a baseball bat and sent home. <laughs> Um, because all of us are stretched so thin, um, how how does that happen in in a time frame when getting staff and getting recruiting is so difficult? Well, you know, the passion of the clinicians in both of these cases is the best recruiting tool we have. We had no trouble filling the clinical positions for the severe behavior outpatient treatment because the clinician was able to um really explain the clinical and the professional benefits you know it's an opportunity for people to do research it's an opportunity for people to present it's a rare treatment model and those are that those kinds of words are music to clinicians ears that they want to be part of the best of the best and she was really able to sell it what we're talking about here in all of these uh situations our hr issues our business issues teaching people to speak each other's language and then knowing which lever to pull for whatever your next step is. And so we were able to leverage her to recruit. And that, I think, was a tremendously successful um, situation for us. Wow. Go back one more. Yeah. more? Yep. Oh, this is just our, you know, our, our takeaways, right? And even in the best of times, uh, you know, COVID is, 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 the past two years and you know we're coming out of it we all know if you've been in this business long enough 
right? We all know that um, there's always going to be another crisis, another challenge around the corner. So um, even in the best of times, growth is a journey. But um, you know what we've learned through all of this is that um, we need to make sure everyone knows where we're going, their role in it, um, that that we intend to invest in it and support it, that we engage people, that we know our market, we take advantage of the data and the intelligence that's available to us through open minds and other sources, mm -hmm. and then of course that we're able to really enunciate our brand, our expertise, um, our, our value, your value, your brand, your expertise as an organization so that you can um, determine how you're going to grow, where you're going to grow, and who you're going to grow with. Do you have an idea when this autism model will be more fully developed, when you'll be adding pieces? Have you thought that far ahead at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, first of all, we didn't think that we would start with the two services that we started That's with, really right? True. So we, this list that, um, that, that we shared with you, um, this was not the order. Uh, we had a completely different model. Um, and what has happened is that as we began to talk about, you know, the the, the, the impact and the um, um, of the clinical team, we started off in, in this way. Um, we are in the process of building out uh, a fully developed business plan and projections for this entire um, this, bu this business, really. And our growth plan is a five-year growth plan. We're uh, in the um, uh, kind of the second half of year one. And so we anticipate really building this out over the next uh, four years. You know, we started in, in year one and, and we anticipate adding as we go. Um, you know, just as, a, as a, an addition, um, you know, the investment and, and all of this takes, takes, it takes an investment, takes money. Um, in the case of all the autism diagnosis, we're um, renting uh, a, a clinical space from the partners uh, who reached out to us initially. So we didn't have to go rent space. We didn't have to sign a you know, big expensive lease. Um, so we're, we're doing it there. There's some wonderful alignments there. So we'll be, uh, you know, we'll find other ways to work together. In the severe uh, behavior day treatment program, we had space. And so uh, we're we were able to use some space that we had for this purpose. It's not enough space for the, the, the long-term view of the program, but it's enough space to, to prove uh, it, that it, to prove the concept right to the organization. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is, uh, I mean, our folks can't wait to do. Um, as a side note, we have been doing consultation and training um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty often. And, um, you know, we realize that uh, there is a lot of need out there to share information. Um, and that there's, uh, particularly in the, in the training perspective, there's just a lot of opportunity outside of our industry to talk about, um, you know, uh, a neurodiversity and, and what pe you know, awareness or what the sensitivity and awareness of, of autism and brain injury. You know, and that's a really good example because that's another model that came through because of work a clinician did advocacy work. We have a clinician who trains, she trains local police departments, she trains the CSA around how to um, sort of identify work with individuals who have autism they might be seeing in the course of their day. And when she shared this with us, we're like, huh, we could probably be doing that for a lot of people. So there was, again, there has to be a structure for it. So now Judy's team knows when a call comes through about consultation, where it gets funneled, we have a process in place for it. We have a group of clinicians who develop the training materials. You know, around that, we were very fortunate to be able to utilize and leverage some of the clinicians we hired for the Severe Behavior Day program. We also put a system in place to monetize and give clinicians bonuses if they created training materials for us because we can't ask people to do that during the course of their day. So we were able to develop the materials pretty easily using the people we had in place. And now that we have them, we're really ready to go out and market it to others. Right, I also don't want, to, don't want anybody to think that we're just kind of sitting here waiting for the calls to come in. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> there's a whole marketing plan uh, that, that has just been developed uh, around consultation and training. So we uh, we intend to be doing quite a bit of, a bit of it. and. You know, the, the, I'd say the one gift that COVID gave us is, is the virtual training and vir virtual yeah. consultation is very accessible. So uh, we'll be doing a lot more of that uh, in the coming years. So when I think consultation, I think work with other providers, a, a governmental assistance to, to some entity that has a difficult situation. But you're, you're talking about bigger than that and actually out into community. I can... We give are. examples of groups that you'd consider consulting with or, or doing trainings for? Okay, so um, I think that 
um, businesses in, in many, many industries that deal with consumers and deal with the public mm -hmm. recognize the need uh, to, um, to to learn how to modify, uh, how to modify, and how to how to address and how to deal with consumers, uh, neurodiverse consumers. So um, you know, a retail, a travel, uh, um, the uh, you know, uh, entertainment, museums. I mean, there's there's really an endless supply of of businesses that recognize that this is a diverse world in which we live in so many ways. And that uh, we all need to learn, and we all need to be prepared. Uh, as um, uh, as kids with autism age, they become adults with autism, and 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 it's they're in our in our world just like we are, and and in our communities. And that everybody needs to be prepared to um, uh, to, to to learn and to acknowledge and to uh, to embrace them. So I would, and I would add that there are healthcare providers. Yeah who autism is not their area of expertise, but they recognize the need to really be able to adapt their environment or adapt their treatments to individuals with autism in order to get the best success, to get the best clinical success. So being able to partner with someone who's an expert in how to manage an individual with autism, regardless of where they are, and work with a healthcare provider on that is also a really um, a great opportunity. And we then get the benefit of having the connection with that healthcare provider, which is also really a lovely opportunity for us. Yep. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I, I see so many positive takeaways in, in what you've been doing. We're having fun while we're doing it, <laughs> even if we're sitting close together. <laughs> So, I, you know, I think that really uh, these are our main takeaways on this slide. I mean, I think we would welcome any opportunities to engage with open minds or to engage with your audience, Ray, around questions people might have. Stacy, are there any issues I, or questions? I was going to say, we, we do have one or two questions that have come through. Um, you noted at the very beginning of your presentation that the organization was not necessarily growth minded or had the belief they could be. Um, who was the biggest set of challenge? Was it internal? Was it the board? Was it executive leadership? Um, and how did you address those challenges? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, I, I'm going to actually start by just talking about the board. Um, yes, I mean, engaging your board in, in, in these discussions around growth and why you need to grow is, is absolutely critical. Data is uh, data, market trends. Uh, in fact, Ray, uh, Ray was, uh, was, was, uh, came and spent a morning with our board to talk about the market, to talk about the future of our industry. And this was pre-COVID um, and, and really helped our board understand um, you know, where it was going five, seven years down the road and what the challenges would be or the opportunities would be for, for our organization. So uh, so that was really helpful, right? That's, it's always good when there's a third party uh, uh, sharing that information besides, uh, you know, just, just the team, uh, that third party affirmation is critical. Um, you know, I, I would say that being the voice of growth in the organization, <clears throat> um, uh, it was challenging, right? Because People would, you know, see you or you'd invite people to a meeting and they'd be like, yeah, I could see the eyes roll, you know, before the before the acceptance came. Um, it was hard to, 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 to work through it. And I would tell you that I think that our our our, our director level, so our our, lead, our program, our leaders, if you will, were the toughest, right? Because they knew they were going to have to share that information and cascade it to their teams. <clears throat> and so we needed to give them the tools. Uh, and, and the familiarity and the comfort level with the understanding of why we want, why we need to grow as an organization. Again, the benefits, not only to the org, it's not just about top line revenue. It's not, in fact, it's very little about that. Mm -hmm. It's really about the, uh, you know, growth giving the organization the capacity to do so much more, to pay better wages, to attract great talent, um, you know, to, to, to deliver even more on its mission, right? Provide more access to, 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 to care. So, you know, being able to communicate that, and I wouldn't say that that message could be delivered only once. It had to be delivered multiple times in multiple ways with patients. Um, and I think it was also really important that um, there were more voices than one or two, mm -hmm. that that our leadership, our, our executive team, that then our, our, our leadership team is about 80 people, 
that those folks got on board and were able to talk about it and and and, and really describe um, you know what it means to uh, to their teams. I would add that you know for the clinical groups, it was really important to see that the the growth was about clinical excellence, having the best clinical outcomes delivered to the most people, and to Judy's point, not just about the financial okay. status of the organization, mm -hmm. that they really understood our mission and they supported our mission. So all that work we did in building our outcomes and, and appreciating our talent was really important. And then, you know, one of the things I observed that Judy really did early on was to make sure that even when we had small opportunities for growth, it was never built on somebody's back. So they saw that the organization was committed to adding resources when resources were needed. Yep. Can we answer your question, Stace? I think you did an excellent job. And if <laughs> any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out. Judy has shared her information here. Um, I, so much information has been shared. Um, so I want to remind everyone that they can watch the presentation again on demand and download the presentation deck starting tomorrow on the Open Minds website. Thank you both, Judy and Karen. You have been just wonderful to really help people understand the importance of assessments and putting processes in place, understanding each other's languages so that clinicians and business people can all work together to achieve the best for the end consumer, which is what we're all here for, is to make sure that we can deliver the best outcomes. So I'd like to, to thank you again. I'd also invite everyone to join us next Thursday on March 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern for our Circle Elite Executive Roundtable, Less Field, the EHN Mass Casualty Behavioral Health Response Framework, which will feature Kristen Dartry, our CEO of Emergence Health Networks, as she discusses how EHN experience and response to the event in August 2019 in El Paso, Texas, and the support that their organization gave by having a framework of preparedness. Uh, Senior Associate Joe Naughton Travers will moderate that session for us. There is a full list of upcoming roundtables on the Open Minds website where you can download and register for any of the events. We thank you all for your time and you have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.